Now, in this uh, part of my lecture, I'm going to tell you about the restriction activity of type 3 enzymes. And just to recapitulate, the type 3 enzymes have two subunits called the REST subunit and the MOD subunit. The MOD subunit alone is a DNA methyl transferase, and I, I talked about it in my first half of this uh, lecture. But the restriction enzyme requires the MOD subunit also. So it has, requires the R subunit and the M subunit. Both the subunits have to come together and then it cleaves DNA. And we know from our earlier work that the MOD subunit is the DNA binding protein because that is the one which binds to specific sequences. And a number of us, not only from my lab but other labs which work on type 3, isolated REST subunit and showed that it has no activity. Actually, when you isolate the REST subunit, it degrades very fast. So the MOD subunit association is important. It acts like a chaperone. It folds the degraded before the REST subunit can degrade. So R and M together constitute the restriction enzyme in type 3 enzymes. In type 1 enzymes, you have a third subunit called the S subunit. And that is the one which actually binds DNA. M and S together there form methyl transferase. It's called M2S1. And R2M2S1 forms the holo restriction enzyme in type 1 enzymes. So you have R2M2S1 in type 1. You have R2M2 in type 3. And you have R alone in type 2. BAM H1, eco R1, which can act there. So you see the organization complexity. And you must remember that type 1 enzymes are the first enzymes to be discovered by Werner Arbor and others, for which he won the Nobel Prize. And the whole phenomenon was shown because of type 1 enzymes. So if you think of restriction enzymes and you see complexity, and many of us have been thinking about evolution, has one uh, come from two, two gave rise to three, and things like that. It is very difficult to say any of this. But if you arrange these enzymes type 1, type 2, type 3, or in other words, type 1, type 3, and type 2, and you say which is the most efficient enzyme in terms of catalysis, the type 2 enzymes are the most effective. The turnover numbers, the KCAT, the turnover number is very, very high for type 2 enzymes, very slow, very low for type 1 enzymes, and the type 3 enzymes come in between. So that is one way of looking at these enzymes. The type 2 are the most efficient, then the type 3s, and then the type 1s. So much so that in literature for a long time, there was actually a question, are type 1 enzymes really enzymes? Are they catalytic at all? Do they do only one round of catalysis? Bind the substrate, transform the substrate, and then they die. But they are no use. So this question has always been a debate with these low-acting enzymes like type 3 enzymes and type 1 enzymes. Whereas the type 2 enzymes are very good. They go, bind, cut, follow up, next molecule, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, ten thousand molecules can do. They can do. But the type 3s and the type 1s are not so fast. They're very slow. And to understand these enzymes is again a whole very nice area to work with. For the simple reason that they are recognized and cut far away from the sequence. But the type 2 enzymes cut within the sequence. You know, eco R1 recognizes G, A, A, T, T, C and cuts between this G and the bottom G. Whereas the type 3s and type 1s cut away, 25, 27 base pairs. And you have type 2S shifted cleavage enzymes, FOC1 for example, cuts 14 base pairs away or 12 base pairs away. The type 2 G is cut anywhere between 15 and 17 or something like that. So if you look at all restriction enzymes, one, some which cut within the sequence, some cut one base pair away, two base, four base, five base, six base, ten base, fourteen, twenty-five thousand, seven thousand. So it's a whole continuum. So you can think, you know, have enzymes actually evolved in a very bad way and then slowly evolved to a more efficient one. Or the vice versa. They were most efficient enzymes and then the most inefficient came. But nothing can be predicted very easily. But people have their own hypothesis. And I will present one such hypothesis from my laboratory on 
So we looked at restriction enzymes, the type 3 restriction enzyme, because the lab works on it. And for a long time, you must remember, you know, for a very, very long time, there was a lot of controversy about these enzymes, the cofactor requirements. The type 1 enzymes were very clear that they require ATP, they require SAM, and they require magnesium. And they would cut the enzyme. The type 3 enzymes required ATP, but ATP was not hydrolyzed. Whereas with the type 1 enzymes, the ATP was hydrolyzed, and the energy that came out of ATP hydrolysis was important for DNA cleavage. The actual cleavage is the phosphodiester bond, where magnesium is required. But these enzymes, uh, like the type 1 enzymes, had two sequences, and two sequences, the enzyme molecules bound to it, and then when the enzyme molecules moved along the DNA, wherever they collided, they cut DNA. Now with the type 3 enzymes also, they all, most people thought they were just like type 1 enzymes, there were slight differences. So when we started, when I started my laboratory way back, uh, my first graduate student in, in the restriction enzyme, uh, Swati Saha, repeated all the earlier experiments that people did with the ECOP1 restriction system and found that ATP was hydrolyzed. So in, 95, in 1995, we published this paper in JMB where uh, we showed that ATP hydrolysis is important for DNA cleavage. So if you use a non-hydrolyzable ATP analogs like AMP, PMP or ATP gamma S, there is no cleavage of DNA at all for the type 3 enzyme. So clearly, saying that ATP was required, ATP hydrolysis is important. And we had also shown by in the metal transfer as well that ATP enhances binding to specific sequences. At the same time, uh, you know, Tom uh, Bickle and Dietrich Kruger in 95, in November, we published in July, but these guys published in November, a very nice paper in EMBO, a classic paper in 1995. Uh, which said that these enzymes recognize two sequences in opposite orientation. If you have the same sequences in the, in the same sequence, in the same orientation, the enzymes will not cut DNA. If you have a circular plasmid with one site, there is no cleavage. If you have circular plasmid with two sites in the same orientation, nothing will happen. But if they have an opposite orientation, then there was cleavage. And they came up with a very nice hypothesis, very elegant hypothesis, which is something like this. I have to use the board for a minute, uh, others may not be able to see it, but something like this. So this is one side, this is one side. One enzyme molecule will bind here, one enzyme molecule will bind here. And this would move, and when they collide, they would cut either 25 base pairs on this side or 25 base pairs on this side. But not both sides are cut. And we still don't understand how that stochastic event happens. It's a random event. And the experiment they did, very nice model they had, they put a lac repressor in between. They had a lac repressor site here, put a lac repressor. When you have the lac, these are all done in, in vitro, okay? You take purified lac repressor, purified restriction enzyme, purified DNA with two sides, there is no cleavage. The minute you add IPTG, IPTG will bind to the repressor, it will remove, these guys will come together, and then you have cleavage. So very nice experiment, very elegant experiment to show by molecular block that enzymes have to collide before they cleave. Without collision, there is no cleavage at all. So this is the background. So when Swati started in my lab, we first showed that ATP hydrolysis was important. If you don't add ATP or if you use an analog, then there is no cleavage at all. And therefore, from this model, it became very clear that enzymes require energy to move, to translocate along DNA, and that energy come in, comes from ATP hydrolysis. <coughs> this was in 95. These enzymes were first characterized in 75 in Tom Bickle's lab and Werner Harbour's lab. And for 20 years, people believed that this was the case. This was happening. And the 95 paper in EMBO by Tom Bickle and Kruger clearly said that collision was involved. And from then onwards, 
a lot of developments have happened and that is what I'm going to discuss and what we have done to add to the confusion in literature. There's most, mostly confusion uh, to the literature. I'm going to present the work on P15 restriction enzyme. We have done also with the P1 restriction enzyme, but I'll talk about the P15. The P15 restriction enzyme, as it's shown here, has a modification subunit of 75 kilodaltons. I talked about this earlier. This is a methyl transferase. This is the restriction subunit, which is 106 kilodaltons. And these two guys have to come together in an R2M2, is about 440 kilodalton complex, which is a restriction enzyme. The rest alone has no activity. But the rest has all that ATPA, the helicase motifs and things like that. But these two together to come together to form an R2M2. And without ATP, there is no cleavage. When you add ATP, there is cleavage. And in the most simplest manner, you can represent it this way. So this is one site. This is one site. This is one R2M2. This is one R2M2. So this R2M2 goes in this direction, this R2M2 comes in this direction, you have an R2M2 to the power of 2, and that is the restriction enzyme. When you have R2M2 into 2, then that is proficient in cleavage. But most interesting, when that it cleaves either 25 here or 25 here, not in between. So what determines that is still not known. And this is where the structure might help us. And I am under, I, I'm un, given to understand when I went for the t engine meeting uh, that uh, the NEB people with collaborations with Anil Agrawal are actually solving the structure of the type 3 enzyme. So it will be very useful to have this. Okay, so these enzymes are very simple. They recognize and they cut here. But they cut only on one side, uh, on one side of the CAG, CAG. The other CAG, CAG which is required, is not touched upon. So it's a very random event that occurs. Because both these sites are same. The CAG, CAG here, the CAG, CAG, CAG there. But either 25 here or 25 here is cut. And we still don't understand how that happens. But this enzyme is very interesting because it has metal transferase also. The R2M2 has metal transferase activity. It has an endonuclease activity. And because it has helicase domains, for a long time, people thought it has helicase activity. It can unwind DNA. <clears throat> but Swati Sahin in my uh, lab, it's a negative experiment, clearly showed that there's no helicase activity at all. There's no need for unwinding of two strands for cleavage. But the motifs are present. So again, in terms of evolution, this becomes an interesting protein. There's a, some kind of a link between helicases, recombinases, transposases, and some of these enzymes. But that's a side story that we are talking about. Now, as I said, in literature and for a long time, people believe that these are not enzymes. They do something, but they are not like regular enzymes. Enzymes are ones which do multiple turnovers, you know, multiple rounds of catalysis. It was also believed, it was also shown at that time, and it was there in literature, that when you take a DNA, lambda DNA or any big DNA, and use a type 3 enzyme, you get partial cuts. You never get full cuts. That was sorted out by saying that you require two pairs of inverted sequences. And if you have only two pairs of inverted sequences, the enzyme would cut DNA. But then it was also believed that these enzymes don't turn over. Once they cut, they're somehow inactivated. They don't do a second round of catalysis. Now this puzzled my student person called Raghu, who said that if these are enzymes, they should do at least more than one round. They're not single turnover enzymes, but they must be doing multiple turnover. So he did, after many thoughts and tribulations, he did this experiment. And I'll tell you in brief what this experiment is. So you have two sides, you have enzymes with two sides. Either here or here it cuts. But after it cuts, the enzyme is still on the site. In other words, from the earlier model it was shown 
that when these two enzyme complexes bind to this two sites, the intervening sequence is looped out. Okay? Looping occurs and then the two enzyme complexes are brought together and then the cleavage occurs. But the enzyme all the time is staying bound onto the site. And therefore people believe that these enzymes don't have a turnover. Because they, they sit on the site. They cleave somewhere but they sit on the site. And therefore they don't turn over. That was the puzzle. So Raghu in my lab decided to test this out. So what he did was an experiment. The result is shown here. So when it binds and when it cleaves, okay, it might still sit on the site here. But there's a protruding end. So if you now add an exonuclease and chew it off, then this interaction becomes weak and the enzyme can fall off. So by titrating the enzyme, uh, titrating with DNA, different amounts of DNA in the presence of exonuclease, as is shown here, for example, if you see here, this is the supercoiled DNA. When you add the enzyme, you get linearization. This is uh, uh, minus atomate, plus atomate. And when you add the exonucleus, for example, you will find that because of that cleavage occurs, you can, you can get, uh, because of the, uh, the removal of this, the enzyme is able to fall off. If you add double the enzyme, uh, double the DNA concentration, you get double the product. If you increase it by three times, if you increase it by four times. So he did the titration in this manner, DNA to the enzyme ratio, and found that the enzyme is able to fall and bind again, fall and bind again. And it has to fall off. In an in vitro experiment, the only way to make it fall off is by using an exonucleus. So there's a cooperation between an exonucleus and an endonucleus. And in the cell, you have a lot of exonucleases present, like BC. So many exonucleases are present. In vitro, when people did experiments, they only found that only one round. It was not doing any more. But by using a combination of exonucleases, and by doing this titration experiment, by using different concentrations, the ratio of DNA to enzyme, I'm sorry, this is mixed up here, this slide is rearranged here, it can perform multiple rounds of cleavage in presence of exonucleases. And this combination of exonucleus and endonuclease increases the efficiency of the enzyme. And we said, based on this experiment and a few other experiments, Raghu actually concluded that there was a functional cooperation with an exonuclease. So I'll just tell you the model. This is the enzyme with two sites, ATP hydrolysis, DNA translocation, one site gets cleaved, no release of cleaved or methylated product, whereas here when you add an exonuclease 3, for example, removes the cleaved DNA, you have the enzyme again formed, which now goes for binding fresh rounds of catalysis. So when you have an overwhelming infection, MOI in a page uh, experiments, for example, it is possible that the enzyme stays bound to this, but in, in vivo you have exonucleus which will remove the extra uh, uh, DNA that is the, the enzyme is clinging to, loosen the interaction between the enzyme, and the enzyme is able to do this. So based on this and other experiments which uh, he did, uh, we said during the 50th year of the Watson Creek, this was published in the uh, cover page, that these enzymes, like type 1 enzymes, which cut 1,000 base pairs away, type 2s, uh, type 3s, 25 to 27, type 2 Gs, at that time, the type 2 G, 14 to 16, 9 to 12, and this, the efficiency of cleavage increases as you go down this list. And it is simply because the type 1 enzymes have a lot of baggage. They have an R, an M, an S, whereas the type 2 have only the R. Plus, you require so many cofactors for type 1s. You don't require cofactors except for magnesium here. But in combination with this, and we, we calculated the catalytic constant for these enzymes, and we proposed this model of functional hierarchy that the type 2 enzymes are the most efficient than that, but the type 1 enzymes are the first ones to come. But in evolution, as Professor Kobayashi also would agree, you can be wrong or right, you can argue both ways, and uh, the experiments have to be done. This. But by using this combination, 
of functional uh, uh, hierarchy, we believe that this is what was happening. Now comes the main controversy, and it's only controversies, one after the other. They publish a paper, then we publish a paper. Then they publish against us, we publish one against them. And it's been going on. So the area is a bit confusing now. It's a bit, think of what is the action mechanism? How do type 3 enzymes actually cut DNA? Now this is the first paper that came out in Nature in 1992 from Tom Bickerslab and Detlef Kruger in Germany. They collaborated. A very nice experiment. I think deserves to be in Nature. Very clearly they said, that two sites are required for DNA to be cleaved. If you have one site or if you have sites in the same orientation, it will not happen. And if you see this, very, you know, if you go through all the legends and all, it's very clear you can see there's cleavage and things like that. But Raghu in my lab observed these very faint bands, in the original gels, and then figured out this will not, you cannot account for these faint bands. There must be happening something else. I mean, you require two sites and all that. But how do you account for the other band? If there are only two sites in opposite orientation in a circular plasmid, you must get linear one band. But you see faint bands, very, very faint bands, which he observed. And I've reproduced it here just to show you these bands that you can see here. So he worked out the distances and the the lengths of this distance and the size of these distances from these maps. This is the first study, the Nature paper, which is the basis for the understanding of how type 3 enzymes, that you require two sites, the enzymes would bind. And in the next paper, in 95, they published this paper that the endonucleases translocate DNA in a reaction driven by recognition site-specific ATP hydrolysis. This is the EMBO-J paper in November. Ours came out in JMB in July. But EMBO and JMB are so much different. So EMBO has become more famous than JMB. So this paper is cited very well. But ATP hydrolysis is the first one that we showed that ATP hydrolysis is required. And here, by doing a very nice study, by putting the molecular block, the lac repressor, and things like that, they came up with this model that two sites occupied by two enzymes they would bind and the in-between sequence is looped out. I'll show you a model of this. This is all on, based on gel experiments, huh? DNA restriction digestion experiments. So, you know, by la if you have the lac repressor, you do not have a cleavage. When you have a repressor, IPTG, I will not. This is all their data. They came up with this model. And the model like this, the two sides, the blue ones are the mod, the red one are the R, but it's actually R2M2 and R2M2. Please remember that. And these complexes bind here. And the intervening sequence between the two sites can be 36 base pairs or it can be even 3 kilo base pairs. The intervening sequences are looped out. And for DNA looping out and translocation, you require energy. And the energy comes from ATP hydrolysis. And when they collide, we still don't understand either there or here they cut and you have two fragments of DNA. So this is the experiment. If you put a block, a lac repressor, you don't do not cleavage. If you add IPTG, the repressor is taken off. These guys will move together, they come together and then cleave DNA. So DNA translocation model is now was accepted. And nobody ever questioned it. And this was the same model for the type 1 enzymes. The type 1 enzymes also locate, but there they had a very early on they had this electron microscopic evidence of loops and all that. But from 95 onwards, nobody ever saw loops for type 3 enzymes. People tried, but nobody ever saw loops. But this model was still in vogue because it was a very nice model, very elegant model. Very simple experiments to explain that this must be happening. But nobody looked at the models. Okay. So Raghu was also worried about those faint bands, those very faint bands in the cleavage of the Nature paper and in the EMBOJ paper. And he started working on it. And at the same time, in 2004, so 95 and 2004, almost nine years later, Detlef Kruger's lab in Germany, by using scanning force microscopy, 
actually observe these loops. You see this. You can see the loops here. I, I, I think I have a better picture in the next one. Yeah, you can see these loops here. This is scanning force microscopy. I'm not an expert on it, uh, but uh, they did some controls which worked very well. If you add ATP, you add more ATP, the size of the loop increases and things like that. And therefore, everybody said that looping was the correct way of doing things. There's a proof now. After nine years, there's a proof that DNA looping is occurring. But, you know, the concentrations of enzyme that these people used were enormous. Hundred times more than required. So one, one worries about artifacts when you use high concentration of enzymes that this can be possible. Let me just go back and see whether I missed something. Ah, yeah. So Raghu in my lab was working on this problem of trying to understand what those extra bands in those papers were. And why only one side was being cut. When you have two identical sides, it cuts only 25 years or 25 years. Is it possible that the flanking sequences affect the cleavage? So what he designed was to have an identical sequence on both sides of CAG, CAG. But in all these experiments, he used the linear substrate, not a circular substrate. He used a linear substrate. A linear substrate is a substrate, but not as good as a supercoil substrate. But even with this identical, uh, with linear substrate, he found that you get 50-50, sometimes 50 here or 50 here, and the sequence context did not matter at all. There's something else that matters, and we still don't understand what that matters. So this was the first thing, that the sequence context of the recognition site or the cleavage site do not influence the rate of cleavage by the enzyme. And cleavage at one of the two head-to-head -head sites is a consequence property of the enzyme. There's something in the enzyme which decides that once one cleavage is made, the other cleavage is prevented for some reason or that. But it's not the flanking sequence. In restriction enzymes, many times, even in ordinary restriction enzymes, uh, sometimes you get the DNA cut or do not get cut because of flanking sequence. You might have a site, but it may not be a good flanking site. So you must worry about that. So we thought something like this was happening, but that was not the case here at all. In the process when he was doing this with linear substrate, he did a number of substrates, and if you look at these uh, substrates very carefully, I'll just explain one or two of them. There you have here non-head-to-head -head sites. In some you have head-to-head -head sites. Here you have non-head-to-head -head sites. So all sorts of combinations of various substrates he made this. But these are all linear substrates. So on linear substrates, whether you had head-to-head or non-head-to-head, -head, or even one site fragments. Excuse me, what are the yellow and the red arrows? Which one? And the white triangle. There are three symbols. Yeah. I don't understand. Yellow arrow, red arrow, and white triangle. There are three symbols. No, 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 I'm sorry. This, uh, okay, I'll tell you what. This is, uh, let me get this. This is the site, okay? Uh, the Mr. I uh, missed the first slide, uh, one of the slides which I get. These are the two sites in opposite orientation, yeah. B and C. These are the actual sites, okay? This is a D, which is a site uh, with only one site, or only one in, in one direction. There's no corresponding site here at all. These here are in inverse orientation again. There's a, these are two sides in opposite, but in a circular they would face together, if you want, if you were. These um, yellow and red, I, let me just come back. Maybe I'll, I'll remember what they are, what they indicate here. I can't remember, uh, Professor Kobe, I have to remember this something. Um, 
But this is what is important, I think. I don't know what they signify, but there are, these, are, these are the sites I know. These are the sites in uh, opposite orientation, I mean, facing each other. So this is a site that can be cleaved between B and C. Uh, this is the C and D in opposite orientation. They do not cleave at all. They are cleavage product, maybe, the second line. Yes, you're right. These are the cleavage products. I think the sizes of the cleavage product is written. I don't know what it is. I'll come back to it. Maybe I'll get it back once I go through these lines. But what would uh, be the reason? He found with linear substrates, whether you had one site or you had two sites in same orientation or you had in opposite orientation, he had cleavage patterns which could be accounted for, which was not the case with the model. The model very clearly said that you should have opposite site orientations. I think that was the problem. So that clearly suggested there was something different from the model that was suggested. And those faint bands that he saw in the Nature and in the EMOJ paper actually accounted for that. That if once you have a cleavage and you have a linear fragment, even if you have a site there, you can get a further cleavage. And then you can account for those faint bands there. So he further went on to do experiments, and this is here, the one case here. So this is, uh, I still can't get this, what is red and yellow are, but I'll come back. One of the experiments that Raghu did was, which showed that interaction of the enzyme with the five prime end of the DNA site. And here, if you look at it very carefully, you, he generated all these uh, fragments, a 1.3, a 0.45, a 0.85, with one side, with uh, two sides in opposite orientation, with ends free. And he found that many of these, where the ends were blocked, if the 5 prime end was blocked with the lac repressor, there was no cleavage, there was no effect of cleavage at all. It didn't matter at all whether you had the repressor or you didn't have the repressor. The fragments were identical. But when he did with the three prime end, for example, he found that the presence of a lac repressor at the three prime end of a fragment mattered a lot. This is just an expanded version of this that is shown here. And you can see that some of these extra bands that you see more cleavage here, for example, clearly suggested that the activity of the enzyme on single site linear DNA is prevented by the lac repressor bound three prime site of the recognition, downstream of the three prime uh, recognition site. And therefore, with this kind of analysis here, which is uh, quite clear, you see that the intensity of the band that is much more. When you have the repressor, you hardly have anything. When you remove the repressor by adding IPTG, you have more cleavage here. So the model is something like this. I'm sorry, uh, uh, it's not clearly said there, but something like this. Or maybe I have a slide which shows that. So this is what it is. That you have an enzyme with two sites. R2M2 binds here, R2M2 binds here. In an ATP hydrolysis dependent manner, both these guys will move. They will collide. And we still don't know whether they cut on this side or this side, but they cut on one side. So they do translocate on DNA, but what we believe is protein translocation. Because even at this time, nobody had seen the loops at all. But this is on linear substrates, not on circular substrates. And when you have one site, for example, an enzyme molecule will bind here, and it will move and go to the end. The interaction at the three prime end is important, not at the five prime end, because this moves in a direction. And at the three prime end, in some manner which we still don't understand, there is a reversal of the flow of this enzyme. <coughs> so this enzyme is moving back now this way. Another enzyme binds here because this site was free. These two guys now move in opposite direction. They collide and they cut. And therefore, Linear substrates with one site are also a substrate for this enzyme because we do see cleavage 
And if you block that linear site, the linear fragment at the three prime end with lac repressor, there is no cleavage. You remove the lac repressor, then you have cleavage. So the simplest explanation that we can think of is this something like this, that the enzyme binds here, moves and reverses. And in the meantime, this empty site is occupied by another enzyme. And then this moves here, this guy is coming back here, and therefore you have cleavage here. And all those faint bands in that Nature and EMBO-J paper can account for single site as a substrate for this. They're not very efficient, but then you see those sites, you can only explain them by saying that there is protein translocation as one of the methods that the enzyme uses and not just looping. Until then, there was no looping at all. This was in 2004. And in 2004, Kruger published a scanning force microscope to show some loops. But they were done in such harsh conditions, one suspected there were artifacts of this. So it became very clear that protein translocation is a method that enzymes can use. DNA translocation was the method that was proposed in 95, but we proposed in 2004 in this paper that proteins, the enzymes must be moving along the DNA. And only single molecule experiments can tell us. And we are still in the process of doing the single molecule experiments. Now in this process, uh, what has happened that when we did these experiments, <coughs> when we added cyanofungin, cyanofungin is an inhibitor of metal transferase. It's an analog of SAM. It's a very good competitive inhibitor of metal transfer for all any metal transferase. But our enzyme requires SAM for cleavage. Now again, this is a controversy with Mark Shelkin in Bristol. They don't agree with our results. But our enzyme preps seem to require uh, SAM. But when we use cyanofungin instead of SAM, we found that the P15 restriction enzyme does not require two sites and all that. Even with one site, the efficiency of cleavage is much, much more in the presence of cyanofungin. And therefore, this has been used now in all the serial analysis of gene expression and things like that, where type 3 enzymes are used. But the presence of this analog actually enhances the cleavage activity. And more interestingly, we find that even if you have the lac repressor now here, in between the two, the minute you add cyanofungin, this repressor is gone. It, it, it somehow doesn't seem to affect. We get much, much better cleavage that uh, does not require the interaction of two P15 molecules at all. At the same time, Kruger also published that if you have two sequences right next to each other, the enzyme still cuts DNA. So this enzyme is a very peculiar enzyme. It does all sorts of things in different people's hands and, the sub and nobody has used the same substrates, either Kruger or Mark Shelton or us. And only now we have decided to sit together and find out that what this enzyme is all about because the mechanism is still not very clear at all. Now to add to this confusion, there are more experiments that have been done. And that is that with David Dryden and a group in Cambridge, uh, Robert Henderson, uh, we did the atomic force microscopy of this to see the loops. The scanning force microscope loops were fine, but they were used under very harsh conditions of high enzyme concentration and things like that. So with David Dryden and Robert Henderson and us, we actually formed these complexes in the presence of ATP and in the absence of ATP, and actually showed that most of the, here you see here, by atomic force microscope pictures, the majority of the enzymes were bound to recognition sites, and they were bound site specifically before any process relying on ATP hydrolysis. ATP hydrolysis was required for an event after binding. So that's the first figure there. And in the second picture, we show here that these complexes in the presence of ATP on one site, and you can see that between two salt conditions, low salt and high salt, and these are all scanned. You can definitely see these uh, uh, loops here. The distances, the angles, subtended, all have been measured here under the loop uh, contour, the number of loops. All these experiments under different conditions clearly said that the enzyme by itself, without anything else, actually loops out. But for the actual translocation, there's an extra loop that moves. And, that is, and in that, you require ATP hydrolysis. But diffusive looping, is a major constituent of this mechanism. A number of controls that have been done, all measurements have been done here uh, by these uh, methods, and to show that 
um, these uh, complexes are genuine and uh, uh, this is what you find that in the presence of ATP on two side complexes you can see the number of loops that are formed here these are all statistically significant and the loops are formed by 3D looping rather than by translocation so loops were there but the loops were not because of translocation the model originally proposed translocation loops so there are two kinds of loops here you are talking about diffusive looping that is three dimensional looping and translocation loops which are active loops so there is a difference between the two and this is where the controversy continues because by using entirely uh, uh, another uh, technique which I will show you first this is all the AFM studies with the lac repressor that blocks DNA cleavage this is the loop contour length and things like that and with the most sophisticated AFM which is very fast almost like real imaging that you see uh, with people in Japan that uh, Henderson and David Dryden did this in, in Olympus uh, using the Olympus machine you actually monitor uh, uh, you know where you get 10 frames uh, per second using this fast scan AFM that the loops that you see here and under different conditions the basic uh, contribution comes from diffusive looping and actually when translocation occurs there is only a small loop that is important which I've shown which I'll show you in the last slide which is here <coughs> if we go through this specs this is what it is this is the structural model for DNA cleavage by the p15 this is the r2 m2 two sites where it is bound that when the r2 m2 come together there's dimerization dimerization is very important and once dimerization occurs you have actually basically a diffusive looping that you see here but when actual translocation occurs you find this extra loop that is coming in so the contribution of looping by translocation is small majorly it is looping that is diffusive looping when enzyme binds it loops DNA and this is the controversy that we have with the Mark Schenken group because he has done the other experiment, a single molecule experiment, where has taken a DNA, stretched it all the way by using magnetic tweezers, and then he sees that uh, it cuts DNA. So if you stretch DNA, there's no question of looping at all. But he finds cleavage altogether. And now both of us have written a paper together which we say that both of us are right, uh, saying that there are some conditions which are not to be done properly or to be done properly that one could expect this mechanism. So I'm, I'm sure the uh, whole thing is very confusing at the moment. The actual mechanism is not known. We think that the structure might help us to determine what is actually happening. We see loops, but the loops that we see are different kind of loops from AFM experiments. What Raghu has seen in my lab is actually protein translocation that is happening. Again, single molecule experiments have to be done. Label the DNA, label the protein, and if the protein is moving, and then you have fluorescent thread changes that can be monitored. So these are the experiments we need to do. We are not doing at the moment, but we need to do this. But then these enzymes are fascinating in that sense, because uh, uh, the mechanism, and uh, there's a lot of uh, similarities to many of the recombinases and transposases proteins where mechanisms have been well worked out. Resolvases, for example. And uh, these add to the new dimension for those enzymes. <clears throat> so this is what I wanted to say. So most of the work done in my lab by the type 3 people are here, listed here. And the collaborations with uh, Robert Henderson and uh, David Dryden on these AFM experiments uh, have helped us a lot in understanding how these proteins actually work or do not work. We still don't know what is actually happening. So I'll stop here uh, just to say that these enzymes are very fascinating, these enzymes which were discovered long ago, but now you know there's, there's so much more to be done. Biochemistry, structural biology, and you know, actually the biology of these uh, uh, restrictions of, uh, with these enzymes is now becoming more and more interesting. So there's a lot more to be done, and I think for the next eight years before I retire, I will continue to work on type 3 enzymes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.